Number 10, Overshadowed and the Beard. Hatshepsut for a long while was content to play the supporting role among Egypt's royals. But when she decided she wasn't anymore, things took a turn. She was the daughter of Thutmose I and wife slash sister to her half brother Thutmose II. I know, don't worry, I'll address it later in the video, stay tuned. When he died in 1479 BC and left their son as heir, she took on the role as regent to Thutmose III. But she basically just acted as the rightful ruler. As the young king came, of age finally, she declared herself pharaoh. The strangest part was that she chose to portray herself in pictures as a man with a male body and a false beard. She said that the god Amun was her father and insisted that he commanded her to take charge of Egypt. Who's gonna argue with a god, right? But no one could quite explain the issue with the beard. Nevertheless, during her reign, it was a time of peace and prosperity for Egypt. Number 9, Sesostris. Sesostris was one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, who was celebrated for the extent of his conquests. He stretched the kingdom further than anyone before him, but he was not without his quirks. According to accounts by Herodotus, Sesostris left pillars on every battlefield. Along with the usual bragging and boasting of how he won, he would carve into them images of genitalia, like people do on the bathroom stalls, you know? If he thought that his enemy fought valiantly, he carved a If he thought they didn't put much of a fight, he would carve a Great. Yeah, that just goes to show what he thought about things, huh. The latter was a sign of disrespect for his subdued enemies, while the other was a sign of honor, like, hey man, you stuck it to me. Apparently, some even stood the test of time, lasting over 1500 years, and seen firsthand by Herodotus himself. For those of you who don't know, for reference, Herodotus is considered as the father of historians, one of the very first to take up the task. Number 8, Ceremonial Seating. The whole idea behind the pharaohs was that they were direct descendants from the gods themselves. Therefore, they too had deific powers and had the capability of restoring life to the land. The Nile River had significant importance to the people of Egypt. It provided fertile soil and water irrigation, it was pretty awesome. In order to ensure its abundance would continue, pharaohs would organize a festival where they would ceremoniously fill it with their seed. Yeah, yeah. Some historians believe that this was in honor of the creation story of how life came to be and therefore it was kind of like a fertility festival. Crowds would gather at the Nile and await the arrival of their pharaoh. They would then disrobe and give their pleasure into the river to ensure its bounty. Some historians say it was just the pharaoh who did this, while others say that the men joined in after. Evidence still remains pretty slim as to whether this really did happen, so take this one with a grain of salt, but that's not to say that there isn't any evidence at all that it did happen, so there. Number six, Gobekli Tepe. Just six miles from the ancient Turkey city Urfa, Gobekli Tepe is 100,000 years old. And there are these massive stone circles created by a civilization that predates Stonehenge by 6,000 years. We're convinced it's the world's oldest temple, a holy temple rather. This area in the world, I mean now it may not be a spectacle, but thousands of years ago, you would be able to see the horizon in every direction from this point. You'd also see herds of beautiful animals racing by. There'd be fields of barley, wild wheat, and would have looked like a temple from the Legend of Zelda. It was gorgeous and the landscape was fresh. Mind you, because it was so long ago. It was discovered back in 1960s. University anthropologists, they were doing a survey of the region. They found this place and assumed that it was an ancient cemetery and nothing more, and then continued on their merry way. Then cut to 1994, Klaus Schmidt was doing surveys for himself, found the same site, and knew right away from the first glance that this was man-made. Oh, imagine that, imagine missing Gobekli Tepe the first time and being like, eh, the cemetery. Number five, Anasazi. Before the first skyscrapers were built in the 1880s, the Anasazi built massive stone buildings on the side of cliffs back in the 12th century. Some of these walls housed up to hundreds of residents, right? Like a skyscraper, a building, like a condo, just in the wall. What's now present day Mesa Verde National Park was pretty intense back in the earlier days. Scientists have uncovered some hints as to where these creative cliff builders disappeared to. Well, violence, that seems to be the common denominator here. Yeah, the thing that's still going strong today, well, thousands of years ago, back in the 12th century United States, long-term drought led to the Anasazi to violence, and perhaps they wiped out each other. Other theories suggest that the Anasazi had to abandon their massive homes around the 1300s and then travel south. Either way, these are so impressive to look at. Number four, assassins. This wasn't necessarily something that he did, but something that happened to him that was pretty messed up. As you can guess from the title, it involved assassins. 
Ramses III had a lot on his plate during his reign. There were this group of seafarers trying to destroy everyone, the tomb builders did their first labor strike over wage delays, I get you, the economy was deteriorating, weather was devastating, food production, things were corrupt as hell. And on top of all this, his secondary wife T.A. hated his guts. She along with a dozen members of his harem, the head of the treasury, a military captain, a butler, the butler did it, and the chief royal chamberlain hatched an assassination plot. In 2012, researchers used a high powered CT scanner on Ramsey's mummy and saw a massive throat gash covered by an amulet said to have healing powers. The researchers summarized that an assassin cut through Ramsey's esophagus and trachea, killing him practically instantly because he probably would have just let out that fast. Some other research suggests that this happened before the other assassination plot unraveled, but either way, not a good way to go. Number 3. Till death do us part. Remember that thing I mentioned at the beginning? Well. If you were servant to a pharaoh in ancient Egypt, you were hoping that your dude lived a long time because once they bite the dust, so did you. Now keep in mind, ancient Egyptians believed strongly in the afterlife. So when you died, you didn't just disappear, you literally just traveled to another world. That's the whole idea behind religion anyway. The discovery team organized by NYU, Yale, and the University of Pennsylvania discovered macabre evidence of this tradition. While excavating the mortuary ritual site of Pharaoh Aha, they found six graves not far from his tomb. They were skeletons of court officials, servants, artisans who appear to have been sacrificed to serve the Pharaoh in the afterlife. Aha's successor, Dajir, had more than 200, which are also presumed to be sacrificial burials as well. Number two, Marrying your siblings. Again, remember the thing I mentioned before and now I'm actually getting to it? I promised, I promised, and here we are. Not so long ago, it was normal to court your very own cousin, but today that would be considered a very large taboo. I'm not gonna lie, it gives me the skippies, okay? I don't like imagining ma even marrying any of my cousins, that's weird to me. But the ancient Egyptians took things even farther, or should I say brought it closer, by marrying their very own siblings. Hey, that's one way to guarantee that the line will stay in the family. But knowing what we know about the genetic pool being too close and the complications that can arise, there's things that can go wrong. But nevertheless, it happened. DNA testing from King Tut's corpse revealed that he was a product of a union between two siblings. Pharaohs believed that they were descended from the gods. Therefore, keeping it in the family was crucial in maintaining that bloodline. King Tut even married his own half-sister, same dad, when he was just 10 years old. However, generations of inbreeding resulted in a bone disease that got more severe each time. Cleopatra also married her own brother as well. That was a that was a whole thing, and then she met Caesar and that whole thing we talked about, yeah. That thing. Let's move on. Number one, Akhenaten. One of the most polarizing figures in Egyptian history, Akhenaten tried to get rid of religion and as a result, they got rid of him. Akhenaten earned the title of heretic king and a recent discovery has revealed that his deeds might have been a lot darker. Akhenaten came to power in the 1350s and reigned for around 17 years. He is known for creating a new religion surrounding Aten, who was generally represented as a sun disk. Sometime around his fourth year, he started sending out agents to erase names and images of certain gods from existing texts and monuments. Around the fifth year, he claimed to discover the location of the new royal city and moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Akhetaten, today known as Tel El Amarna. There, his people suffered greatly under slave labor, with bodies being uncovered younger than 20, many with bones broken, spines broken, along with evidence of severe malnutrition. When the pharaoh finally passed, his tomb remained unfinished and his name was stricken from the history books. At least now, we can see why. Kicking off the list at number 10, Roanoke Island, North Carolina. Just off the coast of what is now North Carolina, back in August 1587, around 100 English settlers arrived to Roanoke Island. John White, governor of the new colony, had to sail back to England to grab supplies. But while he was away, a naval war broke out between England and Spain, so his commute was delayed eh, just a tad, you know. He got back three years later in 1590 with said supplies. He's like, hey, sorry I'm late, we got some uh, naval war traffic, you know how it is. Upon arrival, however, nobody was there anymore, including his wife, daughter, granddaughter, anybody. Among the 100 or so inhabitants, they all vanished. The only hint as to where they went or what even happened was the words Croatone and Crow carved into a wooden post. 
and CRO on a tree. Now Croatoan or Croatoan was the name of the Native American tribe that lived on the island as well. But after looking for evidence, theories, even archeological exploration, experts still can't figure this one out. I've actually been to this island back when I was 16, so this one really creeped me out, not gonna lie. That's why I wanted to start with this one. Number nine, the Mississippians. We'll dial back the calendar to 700 CE. Now at this point, before European colonization, the American Southeast was home to the Mississippians. Their main area was the city called Cahokia, which is now modern day Collinsville, Illinois. It's not large either, it's just six square miles. Check out this photo of Monk's Mound, a now historic site. We look at ancient Egyptians and our jaws drop at the site of those pyramids, plus their alignment with the stars, it's all naturally fascinating. Well, Cahokia was once home to pyramids and large wooden structures as well. We're not exactly sure what happened to this 40,000 person civilization, but experts guess famine and disease. Number eight, Katahuyuk. Another ancient city, another ancient mystery. This time we're looking at what's currently South Central Turkey. About 9,000 years ago, it looked a lot different. Katahuyuk was popping off until 7,000 years ago, but again, we have no clue what really happened. The most interesting tidbit of history here is the way that this ancient civilization built their homes. They made houses side by side, really close together, and as fitting as it is for this channel, you would say it was almost like a hive-like system. They didn't have doors, they didn't have mail slots or welcome mats. Instead, they had holes on their roofs. That's how they got in and out every day. So yeah, they would use ladders to get in and out, which I gotta say, sounds pretty exhausting. They're probably all pretty ripped. Number seven, Mayans. One of the most advanced civilizations on this list, the Maya, were somehow able to create these massive stone structures in the middle of southern Mexico jungles. Next to the Egyptian pyramids, I'd say these are almost just as popular at this point. One of the most interesting pieces of the Maya, I'm sure as we all recall, was their calendar and the way that they worked it. I mean, we made a movie about 2012. The news was talking about 2012. Literally 12 years after Y2K, we're like, what if it happens again? Like, you know, this time it seems serious. It's, it's not, it's not gonna happen. We're good for now. We're gonna probably end ourselves before a calendar or you know, a movie does. The Yucatan jungles are filled with pyramids and beautiful complex monuments lost in time, but where did the builders go and why did they leave? Well, a couple scientists analyzed rock samples around these areas and they were able to study the water levels in nearby lakes, suggesting that the reason the mines disappeared were not aliens, but rather they collapsed because of a drought. That checks out. Aliens are cool, you know, and the calendar stuff's cool, but nah, they're just drought. Number four, ancient Vikings. I'm a big Assassin's Creed fan. When they announced Vikings as their newest installment, I was pretty excited. Then I started playing it and I was like, yeah, that's not great. I'm a big Norse mythology fan, okay? But what actually happened to Greenland's Vikings? That's the mystery. Well, around 985 AD, Eric the Red arrived with a large fleet to colonize the island. And of course, was subsequently banished for manslaughter. So now we have two colonies on Greenland, a large Eastern colony and a small Western one. Now these Vikings didn't build massive pyramids, but instead they built stone churches that are still standing to this day. These Vikings were around for a few hundred years, and at one point in time, there were 5,000 Vikings, give or take. Now that's incredible, but later on in 1721, a missionary expedition arrived, and there were not 5,000 Vikings. In fact, there were no Vikings. Where did they go? Archaeologists did the digging and apparently the Western settlement died off around 1400 AD. And just decades later, the Eastern settlement was abandoned. Well, there's a handful of family fun movies that hint to what happened. The Ice Age, yeah. Well, the small one in the 14th century, at least, is the biggest factor on where these Vikings disappeared to. Yeah, just a small Ice Age, classic. That's uh, haunting for a Canadian to hear. Number three. Easter Island. Back between 300 and 1200 AD, Polynesians used canoes, not carnival cruise ships, canoes to somehow travel all the way to Easter Island, over 2,000 miles away from Chile. Yeah, that feat in itself is impressive, but when you start really thinking about the Easter Island heads on the actual island, it gets even more impressive. The Easter Island Moai statues, keep in mind there were hundreds, reach up to 32 feet high, and they weigh over 82 tons. It was a sight to see. That was until the 1800s. That's when the civilization suddenly vanished out of nowhere. Many of these statues were also destroyed during this time. The population as well was decreased drastically and the island's higher ups, be it priests or chiefs, whoever, were all overthrown. Well, whatever happened may give us some ideas for the future. Easter Islanders cut down so many trees that before their seeds could even enter the earth again, rats ate them. So these guys simply ran out of trees, which means they ran out of rope or the ability to make more canoes. So they were trapped. So naturally, a civil war began alongside starvation. 
Plus the arrival of Europeans in 1722, they immediately wiped out most of the remaining Easter Islanders. And then around the late 1800s, waves of smallpox reduced the amount of island natives to just 100. It was brutal. Number one, the Indus River Valley Civilization. What's now modern Pakistan was one of the world's earliest societies. Also referred to as the Harappan Civilization or the Indus, were actually quite large. We were talking about Vikings in the thousands, but the Indus reached about 5 million. Aside from the other earliest civilizations, be it Egyptians and the Mesopotamians, they were considered the most extensive. The world's first ever dentist came from the Indus Valley, so thank you. Something way more interesting though than dentist facts is that when compared to Egyptian ancient cultures, the Indus never built any palaces or temples, meaning there were no priests or kings. But we still get to study ancient texts. Those are always fun and confusing. The Indus had a language that we're slowly but surely decoding today. But even so, there's still around 250 to 500 characters that remain a mystery. Starting our list off at number 10, the first skull. Before we get into some mysterious happenings in history, we have to talk about the very first Neanderthal skull that was ever discovered. The discovery came about back in 1829. The skull was found in a cave near Angus, Belgium. Now at the time, they didn't even realize it was the skull of a Neanderthal. That knowledge came much later, around 1856. And at that time, quarry workers were ripping apart limestone in a Fedhover cave near the Germany city Dusseldorf. But this skull was found in Neanderthal, a small valley of the Dussel River. Yeah, hence, you know, the name. Now we understand that. The skull was human, but it wasn't. This was game changing. Number nine, medicine. You can only imagine the various injuries Neanderthals would have, hunting down a mammoth or, you know, a bison three times the size of you. Odds are you're gonna get a bruise or two. So what did Neanderthals do at this point? Well, that's what this pile of bones is for. Yeah, it's so dark, right? How did Neanderthals live so long without a pharmacy? All that yelling, no halls, that's gonna hurt. Neanderthals' medical skills are pretty similar to what our ancestors did. Herbal remedies, baby, that's it. Herbal remedies. They managed fevers, but when the pain got too bad, chewing on a specific tree may have helped tolerate the pain. So now we're looking back to these piles of bones, we find fragments of these leaves in their, you know, dental cavities. We could study their teeth and be like, mm, yes, I can see what you had for lunch. This makes sense. 40,000 years before penicillin, Neanderthals were chewing on aspirin. They were brilliant. Little dirty secret there. Number eight. Ancient art. Okay, here's where we're at with Neanderthals and art. First of all, we don't have actual representational art, but we do have symbolism. That's pretty close, and also just as fascinating in my opinion, especially when they look like this. These are eagle talons, right? They're about 130,000 years old. They were found recently in the Krapina Neanderthal site in Croatia. Now, researchers believe that they were part of a jewelry set, like earrings or part of a necklace. I couldn't even make this now with the YouTube tutorial. You know what I mean? Yet somehow civilizations were crafting this thousands of years ago. 130,000 years ago. That's crazy. Number seven, deliver me naked. Cleopatra is known as one of the most beautiful women in history, but this could be due to how she used her feminine wiles to get what she wanted. Her beauty and cunning became renowned as a result. While other queens like the one I mentioned before concealed their beauty, Cleopatra was all about showing it off, cause girl, if he got it, flaunt it. In order to help secure the political ally and power connected to Caesar, Cleopatra knew how to make an entrance and knew how to win over a guy. It's, it's pretty easy. He was around 52 when they met and the Egyptian queen was just like 20 and in her prime, so. She looked great. She smuggled herself into Alexandria where Caesar was staying, had her servant tie her up in a bed sack, naked, and carried indoors to Caesar and she was like, have at her, buddy. In other words, she wrapped her naked body in a carpet, made Caesar's jaw drop to the floor, and secured one of the most beneficial unions on the spot. Honestly, not really messed up. Kind of badass. Honestly, just do your thing. Work it, girl. I dream of having that confidence with my clothes on. You know what I mean? Go, girl. You got this. You get that empire. Number six. 
Cats and the Battle. Ancient Egypt would have welcomed the film adaptation of Cats, unlike the rest of the world, with open arms and probably would have built a shrine to it. Giant human cats eating human cockroaches would be revered. Bottom line, cats in ancient Egypt were worshipped and treated like family. It was considered a crime punishable by death to harm one due to the belief in the goddess Bastet. One pharaoh even risked losing a battle because of cats themselves. The Battle of Pelusium of 525 BCE between Pharaoh Samek III and the Persian king Cambyses II resulted in the first Persian conquest of Egypt all because of cats. Cambyses took advantage of the cat loving side of Egypt and used hostages of cats and animals as leverage. So they were just kind of like, well we can't, we can't fight if the cats are let loose. What are we going to do? We can't kill the cats. And that's that's uh, how they lost that battle. Number five, honey coated. Who here hates bugs bothering them in the summer? Unless they're a bumblebee, because we love bumblebees here, right guys? But me too. No one likes the buzzing of blood suckers nipping at your skin while you're chilling out on the beach or barbecue. Well, guess what? Egyptian pharaohs hated it too, except they didn't have bug spray. So what did they do? Well, you know the phrase, you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar? Well, they took that literally. Conveniently, they had servants around them at all times, so to help with the bug problem, they covered them with honey so as to distract the bees and the bugs. So as the pharaohs lounged on the sand, or wherever they were, their dutiful servants took on the job of taking on the bug bites. King Pepe, for instance, had a dedicated slave in his entourage who endured it every day. Poor guy. It was so effective that he had one designated in each room. Poor guys. And finally, number one. Clovis. Taking a look at some mammoth hunters for a last point here. Now this civilization is considered the first inhabitants of the new world. Pretty intense stuff. Hunters would use what's called Clovis points to get their next meal. They would use chipped flint and they had to hunt bison, mammoths, deer, anything that had skin to be used for shelter and or clothing. In fact, this 10,000 year old civilization may have disappeared at the same time as mammoths. After all, with these historical beasts acting as both your gear and your food, yeah, eating them ought to do some damage down the road. Not even an ice age was included yet, and already they're running out of resources. Yeah.